Hello, everybody. We're going to get into Chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really um, rather short. It's all about antimicrobial drugs and um, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. So before we talk about different medications, let's talk about some history about these different medications that we use. So back in the um, end of the 1800s, um, early, early 1900s, Paul Ehrlich came up with a drug that he named Salverson. And what this drug did was it was able to treat um, syphilis, which was a serious disease um, back then because a lot of people were, um, well, having sex um, without using any protections. And syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease. And the problem with this disease is it has, um, if you don't catch it early, the disease will get into your brain and basically kill you. Um, so there are three different stages. Salverson was able to treat the primary stage of syphilis. So if you get syphilis um, within the first two weeks of the disease, you could actually use this chemical and it would help. If you didn't um, get treated, then the disease goes into a dormant phase. And um, once it gets into its dormant phase, then it will move slowly to your brain and it will start breaking down um, neurons, causing lesions in the brain that will lead to um, the different, I guess I'll say, psychoses associated with um, a syphilitic brain. So really, really sad. And a lot of people died from this disease. So Paul Ehrlich was one of the original um, individuals to come up with chemotherapy and a drug. A little while after Paul came up with his um, chemicals, Gerard Dogmack um, discovered Prontosil. And he was able to use Prontosil to treat streptococcal infections. So think of strep throat or streptococcal meningitis. Um, this Prontosil was able to inhibit streptococcal bacteria, and then the immune system was able to fight off the infections. So all of this occurred before um, we found a true antibiotic. It wasn't until Alexander Fleming found um, his petri plate that contains Staphylococcus, um, he found an area that there was no growth and that there was a mold sitting near the area of no growth. Um, the mold hadn't been there. He didn't like put the mold on there. So he was like, what the heck is this? And so he did some tests and he started doing experiments and he was like this okay so this this chemical comes from or this bacteria this, this fungus i'm sorry this fungus comes from a plant or a a not a plant a species known as penicillin penicillium and anytime he put the penicillium spores on the plate and they grew, Staphylococcus would not grow. So he was like, wow, this just inhibits the growth. And he tried with some other species and it inhibited the growth of most bacteria. And he was like, wow, this is so cool. The gram negative bacteria, they didn't inhibit as effectively because one of the, one of the functions of um, penicillin or one of the major functions, I should say, is that it um, inhibits the um, buildup of peptidoglycan, which if you remember, gram-positive bacteria have a really thick, thick layer. So they have lots and lots and lots and lots of layers of peptidoglycan, whereas gram-negative bacteria just have a couple of layers. 
Really, Dudley? Excuse my dog. Um, so he kept running some experiments, but what he wasn't able to do was he wasn't able to purify the penicillin so that it could be used for humans. And so in the 30s, Ernest Chain and Howard Florey actually um, talked to um, Fleming and, and started running projects on Fleming's penicillin. And in 1941, they successfully purified the penicillin and were able to use it on their first human subject. Um, this subject had been in the garden, had cut himself on a thorn, and had a life-threatening infection of Staphylococcus aureus. So think about that. Your plants, they allow you to survive. They give you air, but they'll also kill you. So they started treating him, and he started getting better. He was getting better. He was almost cured, and penicillin ran out, and he died. Super sad ending. But the story doesn't really end there. So this patient died, and what this um, allowed the researchers to realize was that they needed to mass produce penicillin. They couldn't produce enough for, I mean, if they didn't, couldn't produce enough on their own for one patient, there was no way they could, they could produce enough to actually treat illness. Um, so this was right around World War II time, and so a lot of factories started mass producing penicillin, even factories right in our own Peoria, Illinois. And they made enough penicillin that they were able to treat um, soldiers that came back um, or other individuals, I said soldiers, but anybody that was in the war, um, treat patients that um, were gardening or whatever else they were doing. And because of this discovery and the ability to purify the penicillin and use it to treat and keep people alive, um, the three, Fleming, Flory, and Chain, all received the Nobel Prize in 1945. So this is a huge honor and they were really excited, but even, even back then, Fleming knew that we had to um, be wary because if we're using something like penicillin, the bacteria are going to eventually adapt, and they did. So we'll get to that in a few slides down the road, okay? So let's talk about chemicals and how we determine their effectiveness, so their chemotherapeutic index. We look at the amount of the chemical that has to be used um, to kill off the pathogen. That's called the therapeutic dose. And we want to know the amount of the um, chemical that has to be used that would actually kill the host or harm the host. So the toxic dose, dose is the amount or concentration that would actually cause harm to the host. The therapeutic dose is the concentration that kills the pathogen. So you have to look at the toxic dose and therapeutic dose to make sure that it is um, uber effective. And we get our therapeutic, chemotherapeutic index by taking the amount of the antibiotic that would be considered toxic divided by the amount of the antibiotic that is therapeutic that will actually kill the pathogen. And so you want to have a relatively high therapeutic, um, chemotherapeutic index um, to make it a very healthy um, or a decent antibiotic. So antibiotics can be um, broad spectrum or narrow spectrum. So sometimes broad spectrum antibiotics are better to give because you don't know what type of 
pathogen that you're dealing with. And so if you use a, a drug that will kill off multiple groups, then you're protecting um, your patient from, you know, lots of different types of infections. And then you can figure out the type of infection while you're treating them. Narrow spectrums are going to be really effective at killing off pathogens, but they are only effective at one type. And so if you look on this chart here, figure 10.4, um, penicillins are really good at killing off gram positives, not so good at gram negatives, maybe a few, and um, are able to kill off chlamydia to some extent. Whereas tetracycline can kill off most gram negatives, gram positives, chlamydia, and rickettsia. Um, and then we have things like bacitracin, so it's only effective against gram positives. So the narrower the spectrum, the, the more effective the drug might be against a specific pathogen, but it's only going to be good against one specific type of pathogen, or maybe two. So antibiotics aren't used just to kill the pathogens. Sometimes antibiotics will um, inhibit or um, stop the production of certain metabolites so the pathogens can't grow effectively. And then the pathogens will actually start competing for the resources. And when they're competing, they're killing each other. And then also, your immune system can come along and fight off the infection. So how do antibiotics work? Um, this figure shows um, five basic mechanisms and different antibiotics. I'm not going to require you to memorize each of these antibiotics. If you're going into the medical field, you'll probably have to memorize them then, but not for me today, okay? Um, but I do want you to know the mechanisms. So uh, some antibiotics inhibit cell wall, cell wall synthesis. Some antibiotics inhibit protein synthesis, so they're going to affect the ribosomes. Some inhibit nucleic acid synthesis and some inhibit metabolic pathways, so like those secondary metabolites might not be produced. And here is a table of different drugs. Um, if they are broad spectrum or narrow spectrum, the um, mode of action, so what are they doing, and some of the side effects, because different drugs are going to affect the body and um, potentially cause severe side effects even. So let's talk about some of these side effects. One of the most common side effects is an allergic reaction. And you're probably used to, anytime you go to a doctor, anytime you go to a doctor, and you're going through the different medicines and stuff that you take. They'll ask you, is there anything you're allergic to? Um, the reason for this is because um, allergies are really common with, um, with different antibiotics. Um, a major example is there are a lot of people who are allergic to penicillin. Penicillin actually um, binds to some of our body's molecules, some of our body's proteins, and invokes an immune response. And because of this, um, we have made some synthetic or semi-synthetic penicillins, um, ampicillin and amoxicillin. Um, these are not only potentially not as um, problematic for allergies, but they also are broad spectrum, so they can attack um, gram-negative, gram-positive, um, different types of bacteria. Some antibiotics can cause aplastic or can cause um, some major toxic effects on the body. One example is aplastic anemia. So aplastic anemia is the inability to produce proper red blood cells due to um, too little of, I believe it is, and I want to say, 
vitamin A, um, which you need. Like, no, vitamin K, I'm sorry, not A, vitamin K, which is produced in the, um, produced and absorbed in the large intestine. Um, actually, E. coli help in producing this. And so if we don't, um, if we're using an antibiotic that is way more um, broad spectrum, then they're going to kill off a lot of our good bacteria, our normal, you know, gut bacteria, and then our gut can't do its normal job. And that's going to lead to these problems. Suppression of normal flora, just what I was just talking about, um, this can lead to colitis as well. Colitis is um, inflammation of the colon. And so when you have um, suppressed or killed off your normal flora, other pathogens can come in and establish themselves and cause inflammatory responses. Um, and then we have the most horrific one that, that's come popping up in the news all the time, antimicrobial resistance, where microbes um, basically adapt and they... Um, become resistant to these different antibiotics. So antibiotic resistance is um, basically a form of natural selection. So what's happening is we have cells that um, can grow in some environment and if that environment say contains some antibiotic and the cells can grow, those cells are going to grow and replicate while all the other cells die. And so we only have those antibiotic resistant cells. Well, these cells um, can transfer their DNA either through transformation, transduction, or conjugation, which we talked about in chapter seven. And in doing that, they're actually passing their resistance to other microorganisms. And this leads to a lot of problems. So think about all the bacteria, because we are made up of more bacterial cells than human cells. So all of those bacteria that are in our body, that are on our body, they're sharing information. And some of the things they're sharing are going to be resistance factors. And so this is causing um, this antibiotic resistance um, problem that we're seeing uh, today. So why is it such a problem? Because when bacteria become resistant, they're no longer going to die when you um, put them in the presence of an antibiotic. And so this causes um, bacterial infections to become much more severe than they used to be. And this can lead to, well, death of the human. So very serious. Um, what leads to antibiotic resistance? There's so many different things, but mainly it's um, misinformation. If people don't know, they might not do things properly. So if they don't realize that if that just because they feel better does not mean that they are completely cured. They may stop taking their antibiotic early. They may um, share their antibiotic with someone else who's sick because they know that person doesn't have any money. Um, they may be prescribed antibiotics that they don't need because they have a viral infection. So there's so many reasons um, for antibiotic resistance to occur. The things that we can do, um, we don't want to overuse antibiotics that we already have. So you don't take an antibiotic unless you know that you have a bacterial infection. If the doctor says they don't know what type of, of infection you have, but they're pretty sure it's viral, then don't accept an antibiotic if they offer it, because there's no point. But 
that's only one step. We also need to develop new antibiotics. And the problem with that is there's no money there. So what we need is to find some scientists or produce some scientists that don't care about money, that only want to do um, all of their work for the research aspect because they love research, um, which is not always, ha not always easy to find. So there's different tests that we can use to identify um, how effective an antibiotic is. So antibiotics can be um, inhibiting or they can be um, killing drugs. If they inhibit, they're stopping you from replicating and um, then your immune system will have to take you out. Whereas um, if they are cytal, then they are killing off the pathogen completely. So anything that says bacteria static or fungistatic means that it just stops the growth. If it says fungicidal or bactericidal, then it's killing the pathogen. And that's what I just said. So you can read this and I already said it. So. Um, we can look at different concentrations of an antibiotic to determine um, how low of a dose we can use to still inhibit growth. This will help us in determining how much antibiotic we have to prescribe. And then how low of a dose we need to use to kill the pathogen. And so minimal inhibitory concentration versus minimal lethal concentration. And this is the antibiotic um, susceptibility test that is most commonly used. This is known as the Kirby and Bauer disc diffusion test. It uses Mueller Hinton Auger. We take um, some bacterial species that we care about. We um, make a lawn of that species over the entire auger surface. We then um, place depending um, between six and ten different antibiotic discs onto the plate. We tamp them down, oftentimes using things like a sterile um, set of uh, tweezers, and then we put the auger plate in the incubator. Um, of course, we're going to have it um, inverted. And then we wait and for either 24 or 48 hours, and then we can look at the results. So if you look here, you see um, this yellow region is where the bacteria grew. And there's no inhibition around the penicillin, which means penicillin didn't affect the growth. But if we look over here at ciproflaxin or at, what is that one, CM? Or maybe that's a GM, gentamicin. Um, there's a really good amount of space between the bacteria and the actual disc. So that tells you that this one's also effective at killing off these pathogens. This is the end of this chapter, so I'm going to turn this off. I'll upload this video, and I'll get into Chapter 14 really soon. Um, chapter 14 is all about um, the relationship we have with microbes and um, epidemiology. See you soon.